This is the College of Gunfighting. And if you haven't already seen me about the $3 tuition, I will be glad to see you. I am already glad to see you. How about a discount? Discount day. How many on a discount day? Most of you. This evening, Alan Lindrum, who just walked in, will be speaking. And uh, if you haven't read the Osborne and what's his name, uh, or her name, uh, the British researchers, uh, they, they did a, a study which uh, tells us that 47% of U.S. jobs might be automated away uh, this but before the uh, 2035. So, I'll look it up again. Good evening, y'all. Good evening. Uh, again, my name is Alan Lintrup. Spoke here once before. And uh, contrary to what the uh, one of the brothers said earlier, uh, I don't come from Old Park. I live in South Shore. So today I was on at a meeting a little west of Elgin and drive from Elgin to drive some folks back to High Park and we come up here. So it was about two and a half hours before I get Don't use the microphone or do we use it? No. Okay. I will try. But talk softly. But that is going to be difficult to speak softly. Use the microphone. Otherwise you've got to turn it down because it's echoing off the wall. So I'm going to be speaking about automation, computerization, and the 21st century workforce. I'm going to give you a little overview of the kind of sections I'm going to be talking about. And there's going to be more than one opportunity to converse about some of the topics that come up. First, I'm going to give you a little overview of technological progress to date, particularly over the last 70 years. And we're going to go into examination of the study by uh, Carl Fry and Michael Osborne from Oxford University in England. They mainly use data from the U.S. Department of Labor, but it's really applicable to labor in any of the developed countries in the world. And they're you know, just looking at the next generation of computer developments and automation. And then a little bit, another section we'll look at some of the, res I mean, if you want to call it responses or adjustments by potential workers to these developments. And then we'll have a major section of discussion for the social implications of this. And the last section, uh, looking a little further out into the future, is what we call human emulations. Something that is expected to be come into realization during the last half of the century. Most of us will be ceased then, but it's good for some prodding of the mind and thinking of the future, okay? Because some of us have some concern for the planet, for humans that will come after us even if it's not gonna affect us, okay? So, start with a little bit of, of history and so forth. So throughout history, we've had technological changes. Mankind has gone from a time when there were mainly people working in agriculture and as artisans, we shifted to people working in manufacturing and doing clerking and going on to doing a lot of service jobs and a lot of you know management professional jobs. Through all these changes, people have been able to kind of prevail by being able to adapt and to acquire new skills through education. Now, back in 1933, economist John Maynard um, Keynes predicted that there was going to be widespread, widespread technological unemployment. His quote was, due to the discovery of means of economizing the use of labor, outpacing, outrunning the pace at which we can find new uses for labor. Well, as the cost of computing between 1945 and 1980 dropped by about 34% per year. You had such changes as telephone company no longer needing to have, you know, operators. You started to have industrial robots starting with 
GM in the 1960s. And in the 1970s, the airline started to have, you know, self-help uh, type of uh, systems and eliminating employees as a result. Then during the 1980s, or, yeah, 1980s and 1990s, the speed of computers picked up. The, the cost of computing dropped by 64% a year during those two decades. And you had introduction of things like ATM machines and bar uh, barcode scanners. So you had a lot lots of people in tellers and you know cashiers and clerks like that. You also had the introduction of the personal computers. This also had a not only an effect in one's home, but also in the office place. Particularly with word processing and spreadsheets, a lot of office positions were cut back on. Since the 1970s, there's been a steady decline in the share of total jobs that have involved kind of routine, cognitive, and manual skills. And a commensurate increase in the number of jobs requiring um, either in creative intelligence or um, yeah, some type of um, special uh, problem solving skills and so forth. Between 1973 and 2003, those who hadn't even finished high school saw their real wages drop by about 19%. Those who did finish high school had a loss of real wages of about a little over 4%. Whereas high, those who had completed college or gotten advanced degrees saw an average increase in their real wages of about 15%. So during this period, we have seen a, an increase in the premium, if you might say, for getting a college education versus not having a college education. It's gone, it basically went over that 30 year period, it went from a 46% premium for having a college education to one having a 76% premium for getting a college education. So again, that was 73 to 2003. As many of you know, in recent decades, um, Industrial robots have taken over a lot of the jobs in, <coughs> involved in uh, manufacturing. Now, more advanced robots with in, in enhanced sensors and manipulative abilities are taking on more non-routine types of tasks. Just as an example, General, Motor, uh, General Electric has developed a industrial robot that will climb and maintain wind turbines. Okay. Globally, industrial robot sales were at a record of 166,000 during 2011. This was a 40% increase over the prior year. So they're picking up. In healthcare, diagnostic tasks are more and more are being taken over by computers at the Sloan Kettering Cancer uh, Center. The oncologists are using uh, an IBM Watson computer to do a large chunk of the uh, di cancer treatment diagnostics and kind of guiding the chronic care of patients. Fraud detection is an area that is really prime for computers because computers are very good at you know at not using some kind of subjective objective uh, uh, judgments and being able to you know kind of assess a whole bunch of things without being distracted and so forth. They are also able to use a lot of big data, as they call it now, to help in their assessments. So most fraud detection equipment is now all computerized. Computer
computerization has been entering the legal fields, legal services. They've got sophisticated algorithms that are now taking over a number of tasks that used to be done by paralegals and legal assistants. It took these, a lot of the work of preparing for um, you know, trials and so forth, they, the documents they have to go through. Frequently cited example is that of Semantic Corporation's uh, Clearwell system. It's able to do analysis and sorting of 570,000 documents in two days. 570,000 documents in two days they can sort through and analyze. They can replace quite a bit of human labor. <laughs> to close this section, kind of bringing us up to the current point, uh, when I mentioned that back early last year, I noticed, or I got a saw where um, the Associated Press announced that henceforth, uh, any of their routine economic reports would be done totally by computers without people involved. Okay, I'm going to move into section two, unless somebody has some burning question or point they want to make before I move on. Keep going. Okay. Wait till the end. Okay. So the section section is on, particularly looking at the next 20 years or so, roughly to the year 2035, but it's, you know, it's a, a general ballpark. And we're going to be looking at a study that was done or released in September of 2013 by, again, Carl Ock. Fry and Michael Osborne of Oxford University in uh, England. And basically they were looking at, you know, what are the types of tasks, most cognitively and manipulatively, that computers are likely to be able to take on during the next 20 years or so. You know, they looked at all the various subsections of artificial intelligence, you know, machine learning and machine vision, all these other things and kind of, you know, assessed all the various tasks. And then the... Uh, and then they um, took the U.S. Department of Labor's what they call ONET, which is a kind of online thing which basically lists like over 900 jobs. And all the tasks are involved in all of these jobs, at least as best as the Department of Labor is able to determine. If you get all the, these tasks, then if you're knowing what types of tasks are likely to be at least capable of being done by computers over the next generation or so, you have a good sense as to which of those jobs is likely to have you know, certain portions, all or parts of them, are at least being risk, at risk of being automated. It doesn't mean it'll always happen. You know, one employer may do it, another one may not. You know, there's always cost factors and everything else there. That's why they say at risk. Anyway, based on their analysis, and I am going to be giving you pretty soon a handout. Nice colored handout. <laughs> uh, at least I got about, I think we're about 30 of them. So I'm not sure if I'm a little short, but I, I guess 30. Um, but anyway, in their analysis, they're 40% of the current U.S. labor force is at high risk of having, you know, their job eliminated because of automation or computerization within the next 20 years. Now, some of the types of um, jobs that are going to be very much at risk, I'll mention more along the way, but of course, more of the jobs that are in manufacturing will be eliminated. Most jobs in transportation and logistics are going to be computerized or automated. And uh, most of the remaining jobs that are in clerical and in administrative support in offices will be eliminated. And eliminated and supported, replaced by computer capital. So that's just an example. And I'll go into some more as we go along. But at this point, I'm going to take a little break and allow for the distribution of these. So what I'm going to try to do is, yeah, if you can try to get a robot. And I don't know if there's, let me take one of them. What are you doing? Send this here out.
Okay, let's get going. Okay, I'm going to um, try to bring your attention back. Um, you do. I like to. This is falling down. Damn it. I'll get it. I'll get it. And just by the way, I'll let you know that uh, I do have a copy of this. You can always find these kind of things online, researching too. Um, like a printout, which was appended to their study, like listing all the jobs. <laughs> if you want to know what the percentage of a particular job and what its likelihood of being, you know, automated is. So it's got, you know, like 900 jobs or whatever. <laughs> so if it's, whether it's, Telemarketing, you know, 99 percent to those jobs that are very little likelihood of uh, of being anything. They got the whole range, you know, in here. Anyway, on the handouts that you have, and this is clumping the jobs by various groupings. So you you know, and so you can see some of the occupations, for example, computer engineering and science and so forth. The majority of those jobs are in the low risk of being automated, as you'll see down there by the color. But you got a lot of other jobs, you know, like if you're talking about transportation and material moving, where you'll see that the bulk of the jobs are in the high risk of being uh, automated, though there's always going to be some that are more maybe in the medium range and so forth. And you can see there's going to be some jobs where portions of a job might be Automated, but not the other portions. Well, but let's say you got job X, and they can automate 75% of it. Well, they still need a human to do 25%. Well, well, maybe this place had four people who did that job before. Now those they'll take those four 25%, give it to the one person, and eliminate the other three jobs. And those will be automated. So that, that's an example. You're losing jobs, even though there's still maybe some people in that occupation. Just as a point. Now, as, as some of you know, um, if you want to call it technological progress has been moved along or aided uh, by the recent reduction of increasingly complex and large data sets, which are often known as big data. And this has allowed computers, uh, computer systems to uh, no longer be confined to kind of just routine tasks. You don't have to have specific software queries always because they can use these big data sets to make a lot of decision making without having a lot of specific guidance. I'll take that. That's all right. I don't care. I don't care. I'll take it. It's good. I'll Robots are going to be able to take on an increasingly large percentage of 
uh, manual tasks in manufacturing, packing, construction, maintenance, and agriculture. In addition, robots are already performing a number of uh, fairly simple, you might call it household or personal tasks, things like, you know, uh, vacuuming, mopping, cutting grass, uh, cleaning gutters. They have all these things already. And those kind of personal computers are already, they're selling, or increasing about 20% a year sales for those kind of personal computers. And you got more commercial computers in doing services. And these do a little more complex uh, tasks in things like food preparation. Bye bye McDonald's workers or whatever. <laughs> you know, or I can see that in the future. A, a lot of portion of these types of jobs. And also in, in healthcare, in commercial cleaning, well, they can do mopping in the house, they can do mopping in the hallways of the whatever building. Um, and also in, in um, in elder care, okay? And as um, robot costs decline and capabilities in increase through the years, you're going to see an increased number of low-wage uh, employees replaced by automation. And I kind of mentioned this earlier with fraud, but computers are good at um, condition monitoring and novelty detection. So they're gradually they're replacing like whole circuit television monitors. You know, you don't need people to do that, you need computers to do that. And having you have people to check on equipment to see if it was working properly, you know, quality control. Well, a lot of that's going to be eliminated by computers. Yes, sir. And also monitoring patients in, say, ICU units or whatever. <coughs> a lot of that monitoring can be done by computers. You don't need to have as so much staff you, monitoring Thank you, equipment and, and conditions of patients. Okay. A substantial share of employment in, in, in services sales and construction uh, are at risk of being computerized. So in you know in sales you got obviously um, things like the cashiers and uh, counter clerks, rental clerks, and telemarketers, those are all at very high risk. Um, and then uh, as I mentioned earlier uh, even in legal fields, the, the paralegals and legal assistants are at substantial risk, but lawyers, they still found, are not at immediate risk in the near future. Now, free for application is a method that they, is being utilized increasingly as a way to bring uh, you know, automation into the construction business. And so in countries, particularly like Japan, they're increasing more and more of the prefabrication and just having more like you know final assembly on a construction site and this is allowing for more and more uh, of construction to be automated okay it's now completely possible to have a whole uh, road ma road system stored in a computer system on a vehicle and advances in algorithmic uh, vehicle controllers are now allowing, as many of you have heard, for vehicles to be driven by themselves. Yeah. And as, you know, there's going to be a lot more, you know, we can expect that vehicles driven by uh, computers will be safer than those driven by humans for some reason, A, you know, you know, computers don't have, first they can, they will be able to look forward, look back, maybe look to the side all at the same time, integrate all of that. So they have eyes all around. The computer is not, does not go 
you know, it doesn't have a DUI issue. It doesn't have, you know, they're not texting, they're not being distracted, they don't get drowsy. So a lot of the issues that cause accidents that when people are driving are not affecting that. It doesn't mean they'll be perfect, but just comparative rates of accidents can be expected to be less. They are already in California and Nevada allowing uh, you know, automated vehicles to be driven, test, kind of tested. And of course, for that kind of technology to spread to around the country, you know, other states will have to adopt similar legislation because it, it's a political issue. But, you know, they're kind of building up their track record in California and Nevada for that advance. Now, agricultural vehicles, you know, tractors running around or, or forklifts or any other material moving uh, transportation, these are very easy to automate. Now, when it comes to computerization in mining vehicles, you may have heard of it like the company Rio Tinto, which is an Australian mining company. It's shifting over to a lot, most of its uh, mining equipment uh, being uh, automated. So they no longer have to have drivers for their mining trucks or other things in their places. Okay, uh, there's, there's new, new high-tech radio identification tags about the size of Pinhead. They're, not, they're now developing that are going to be able to be attached to every, just about everything that's manufactured. Well, this is going to allow for, first, they're going to be able to track everything from whether it be in a warehouse, to in transit, to being in, you know, retail stores, to even post-sale, to, you know, being in your home or wherever. So obviously going to have a cut down on fraud and theft because things can be tracked. But it's also going to allow for, you know, as I mentioned earlier, logistics is going to be automated pretty much because you're not going to have people having to <laughs> see where X and Y, you know, product is because the system will track it automatically. So. Okay. okay, now I'm going to move to my third section, which is looking at a little, some, a few of the factors that um, we can... Uh, Workers can consider. Um, according to uh, Brian Osberg, the uh, next generation or next wave of automation is going to be followed by a period where there's a slowdown or plateauing. And this is basically because there's going to be some engineering bottlenecks to move to the next phase of automation. And um, So, in this next generation, and for some years thereafter, occupations that involve complex perceptual and manipulative tasks, or creative intelligence, or good um, social intelligence skills, or involve basically working in an unstructured work environment. Those kind of jobs or those kind of skills are basically going to, going to, you know, allow people to still have their jobs. They're not going to be automated in the, you know, next few decades. So potential workers, if they want to get a job, keep a job, get, be retrained for a job, whatever may be a situation, person still in the workforce, those are the kind of skills that one's going to need to have some quote, protection from having loss of work due to automation. Okay. <clears throat> now, we are going to have, obviously, loss of a number of jobs, but there is also going to be some um, jobs created connected to, to the development, production, and maintenance of new computer equipment and, and automation systems. You know, right. if you have robots, you're going to have to have the, the maintenance guys, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. So just like you used to have the Xerox repair, you know, the ro robot repair. So there are, you know, there are going to be new jobs created too. We picture with new, new uh, technologies. So it's not all lost. You will have some new jobs created along the way. 
fixing androids. Uh, to move on to a, a, a future generation, or another increase in automation, basically is going to take overcoming the engineering hurdles that will allow for robots, computer systems to uh, develop creative intelligence and social intelligence skills. You know, to be able to actually, you know, hear, respond, do everything as if they were a person, if they were talking to you. So it's going to take a while to get to that point. So that that's, you know, uh, the next generation beyond the next 20 years and so forth. That's why they said there's a hurdle to, to that point. Now, with computerization, it's quite possible that we may, we're going to have to have, you know, retraining, and it may be easier, at least in some jobs, uh, to provide this with new automated options than in some past generations. But that's going to probably vary from job to job as to what, where that will be less expensive than the past and more readily available to potential people changing careers. Also, our new technology is going to allow some individuals who've got skills to stay in the workforce because maybe they can work from home at least part of the time. They may be able to, uh, you know, uh, be able to care for, you know, a, a sick child or a sick parents and give them a little more flexibility if they got to put in an eight-hour day to, over the course of a 12-hour period and take care of. You know, others in need, they may be able to do that. So if they, the person does have certain skills and they can basically do a lot of their job from home, computers, over the, you know, conferences, whatever they need to do, new technologies do allow for uh, some flexibility. And I want to kind of finish this section with um, kind of a transition to our final topic. And I'll let people who uh, run this thing determine whether I should run through the final topic before we have any discussion. But here's uh, the, the last section is on um, you know, human emulations. So uh, this is what uh, Fry and Albert uh, uh, said with regard to that topic. Quote, whole brain emulation, the scanning, mapping, and digitalizing of the human brain is one approach to achieving creative intelligence and good social skills. It's currently only a theoretical technology. For brain emulation to become operational, additional functional understanding is required to recognize what, dela, what data is relevant, in other words, what parts of your brain are relevant. as well as a roadmap of technologies needed to implement it. While such roadmaps exist, present implementation estimates suggest that the whole brain emulation is unlikely to become operational within the next two decades, uh, and probably quite a bit longer. When they do, however, the employment impact is likely to be vast. Okay. Now, I'm just going to roll out a few of the, obviously, implications. And we can discuss this in the later part, because I think that the leaders want me to cover the last section before we go to the discussion, the human evaluations portion. That's fine. Let's up, I just want to toss out a few ideas here. So when we're dealing with these issues, we're talking about, hey, we've got to have more people with more skills. Going to need to have a lot more college-educated people. We've all been hearing about the costs and the debt burdens of students with college educations. Thank you very much. You're welcome. The society wants to have the people to have the skills. We're going to have to have that social system that subsidizes, makes it much more affordable for people who have the potential to get the skills to be good, productive citizens, to get that education. If you him 
is a high cost blocks a person from getting a good education. So it'd be good. Then it can be a you know a resulting burden on society in a different way, in a, a way that is much worse than just having a big debt. So that's one issue. Another one is unemployment insurance. In the past, unemployment insurance has been, you know, hey, lose a job, you're, you're just transitioning to another job. And it's for a time, temporary thing. Well, we may have a situation where we're going to have a large proportion of the um, potential workers out of jobs. You know, it might be 25%, 50%, whatever. I mean, it may be, you know, for some individuals, it may be the rest of their life. Unemployment insurance may be, have to be a system where employers who have you know, been replaced once their workforce, they're still going to have to maybe pay unemployment insurance in on their robots and to help fund you know, unemployment insurance for the workers that were replaced. You, know, you can come up with different systems, but to have some kind of a system where you know, if you can't be retrained, you have some kind of social safety net will need to be in place. If you have a significant population that's going to be unemployed on a long-term basis, how do you constructively engage them? You know, they always talk about sometimes, you know, having various, um, I guess, you know, uh, things where you know you're 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 doing some kind of community service in a sense. You may be getting unemployment for a long time, but you're you're doing helping in the parks, you're doing X or Y or some other kind of thing. So how do we engage people if we just don't have enough gainful employment for all the population that's out there? Okay? And assuming, you know, for people who are young enough, they're not retirement age, but <laughs> how do we engage them? What do, what do we expect back in the way of contributions to society for receiving part of the social safety net? Then you've got all these systems. Social security. Medicare, etc. People then paying in things like FICA, sporty the, the systems. Shall we now charge, have FICA payments on percentage of quote earnings from the robots to go into these funds to help pay for then those who have been retired or in the past. So we do know that people continue who are still working are paying for those in the past who retired in the past, and you know, kind of each there's a certain you know build up reserve, but a lot of each retirees at any one point, part of that's being covered by those who are currently working. Well, if a large part of those who are currently working are robots, you know, we need to have you're either going to have a big drop in the. In the Payments into Social Security, Medicare, etc., because you don't have as many workers, or you start charging those against what what has replaced the, the workers. So these are some of the thoughts that come to my mind, and we can discuss these further in the final discussion. But those are the big our big big issues for our society, and you know whether we have social uh, peace, you might say, or <laughs> chaos makes a lot, depends on how a society decides to address these issues. Okay, I'm going to now go on to our, the last section, which is human emulations. It isn't totally clear at this time how much cell I mean, it's like cells in your brain, in your body. How much cell detail we'll need in order to emulate, in other words, to scan and copy human brains. The more, the more detail we're going to need to scan and copy, the more hardware you're going to need, and the longer it's going to take before you can actually scan and copy human brains. Why is this relevant? Most people who are knowledgeable in this field think that human emulations, scanning, copying human brains, is going to be, will come about long before 
you actually have like robots where you can have write software that would be the complexity of something like a human brain. That the, the most likely way of actually doing it is to actually, you know, basically copy human brains. And you'll have a digital copy of a human brain in a robot or some kind of computer uh, thing. Okay. Most of the projections are is going to take somewhere between um, 30 to 75 years to accomplish this from present. Okay? So basically, the last half of the century is what we're looking at. So again, human emulations is basically a digital copy of human brain. Not only has your capabilities, but also has your inclinations and a lot of your um, emotions as of the time of the copy. Okay? So, you know, if you love your spouse, <laughs> that, 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 that emulation is going to also love your spouse. <laughs> you know, it's got, it's like a human brain. Wow. Etc. But, what, <laughs> but, what form that emulation is, I mean, that's totally open. It really depends on function. It may look nothing like a human, or it might look something like a human. I mean, what the function is, okay? I mean, so, now, honestly, from the time of copying, and you create a human emulation in some kind of computer, something, the, the experiences and the memories are going to change. So it's like they're diverging. Sorry. It's like they're your twins at a certain point, and now they're you know living different lives. So they will separate. Okay. You know, as I said, we took copying a brain, but a brain is just you know. You can put it in all kind of robots, computers, whatever. So if you if you're trying to copy, you know, maybe an economist and to be create, you know, one great economist and have that economist four thousand of them or have one of them, you know, in every college in the country. You know, they may not need a full human. They may, maybe they'll have a nice smiley face, and the rest will be the box. You, know? <laughs> you don't need a whole, uh, you know, a whole thing. So, but if, if you have, if the person's supposed to be a great forensic detective, maybe they need to be able to get out and get around and do kind of stuff like a forensic detective at a police department. So different functions are going to need different forms. Okay. Now, emulations, human emulations. You know, if they're not working, what are they doing? Well, maybe they'll just be put in sleep mode. Maybe they'll have kind of like a uh, virtual reality where they're kind of on vacation, where they're not at work. We don't know exactly, but you could have various options. Now, what is the impact of this on employment? Well, obviously, tremendous. If you can copy whoever is the best person in this occupation in the country and make multiple copies very cheaply, relatively, that those emulations are going to likely replace most of the people in that field. What employer or what human who is going to hire somebody to do a job or whatever is going to say, well, I'm going to take this person, maybe they're putting nice heart in it, even though this person is not as good comp competent and costs a hell of a lot more, I'm going to use them rather than a copy that's of basically the best person in the field. Most people are going to go for a cheaper, better job. Okay? Now, a person who's you know, top notch in whatever the field is, if they're going to be using a lot of emulations to that person, that person's probably going to get very good royalties. If you, you have an emulation, and it's being used, you're probably getting a you know cut <laughs> for each copy made. And so you probably get a fairly good retirement for that person. I'm gonna be rich. <laughs> but a lot of other people are gonna be out of job in a whole lot of fields. Let's say you have a new business being formed. You've got you know, 
it's like, you know, a Microsoft type of whatever. Is, maybe you got four guys get together, whatever. It could be women, men. I'm not trying to be sexist here. But, you know, somebody's very good at creative concepts and development. you got another person who's very good at producing and distributing. Another person who's great at sales. Another person who's great at general administration and finance. So they form a company. They're doing good. They want to grow the company. Well, they just, you know, make emulations of those original four. The company grows and grows and grows. Whereas, you know, in past generations, maybe they would have had 10,000 employees. Now you've still got the original four owners who are getting all the money, and they've got, you know, 20,000 emulations of them doing the rest of the work. You can see the impact on future jobs creation for that kind of situation. Cuts it down a lot. Now, here's another interesting thing. Emulations will probably be used a lot for elder care and companionship. You know, and, a lot, and this is a lot of, per, you know, sometimes it could be an emulation that's totally impersonal to you, in a sense. Well, you could also see situations where, let's say a couple at age 60, they say, hey, you know, we're going to get up in years, one of us is going to die early, or whatever. Maybe we will agree to each have an emulation of each other made. They'll be put in storage. And so if, you know, Joe dies of a heart attack at 80, and his wife is 78, you know, maybe she'll just say, you know, rather than being lonely, I'd like to have my 60-year-old Joe back in emulation form, so I can at least talk to him, you know. I may not have to do a lot of other stuff, but I'd like to have him sitting there and talk to him and remember me, and I can talk to him like we had a conversation when we were 60. That kind of thing, you know. So it's possible, and people may choose to do that. But that's a personal choice, but I'm just saying, Tossing it out for your consideration, okay? So they may not just do elder care in a nursing home, but they could do, you know, a lot of this could be in-home care, uh, all kinds of stuff. Another thing to consider. Emulations are likely to have differences in class status between different emulations. Not just, I'm not talking about between emulations and humans. I'm talking about emulation A and emulation B. You're likely to have differences in class status based on their capabilities. You know, emulation A, who's a, you know, a brain scientist, a brain surgeon, has probably got more uh, class than emulation B, that's uh, you know, a sanitation engineer picking up garbage. Whatever. You know, so there's going to be some difference there depending on uh, various issues. You get into those issues. Well, emulations have rights. I won't no, I just say human rights, but rights, <laughs> whatever they're called. Or are emulations simply going to be property? Kind of like slavery. Issues to consider, okay? Now, if, again, it's a big if, but if an adequate social safety net is created, we might see a situation where most humans are basically hoping to survive or are surviving, kind of like marginalized retirees, even though they might not be of that senior age, they might be age 40 or whatever, you might have a good portion of the population that's kind of like serving as marginalized and, uh, retirees in a largely robot economy. So maybe a, you know, 100 years from now or 200 years from now, you might get to that. Uh, at least, you know, there's good possibilities that coming down the track. So, that basically is my wonderful presentation to stimulate your mind. Oh, right. So I understand at this point you get the opportunity to ask questions, and I will try to answer them as best as I can, but at least it's good uh, discussion. So I'm going to say the lady over in the back, I see your yes, hand. Yes, sir. Would you like some water? Uh, Jewel Oska used to have a lot of uh, self-checkouts. Uh, recently, I've noticed a lot of those have now been eliminated, and it's more set up like Whole Foods. Do you know why or what, what caused Jewel Oska to abandon the, the self-checkouts? Uh, I don't know specifically. Uh, either they weren't being a um, used as much, or b um, 
They may have got a lot of negative feedback from customers and they found customers going to other stores. I don't know the specifics of that situation, uh, so I, I can't answer that. Um, you know, any type of situation, if, you know, a, a business has to evaluate human response to us. Like, for example, I expect that, you know, you know, 10, 20 years from now, places like McDonald's, all these fast food places, they're going to have one person in the, in the store. The rest of it, everything will be done food preparation, the talking to customers. It's going to be automated. Like one person is basically responsible for you know, opening up, basically keeping, helping maintenance of the things, making sure everything's smooth, maybe filling in if there are things break down, hauling in through the pyramid, you know, as, as things go down. And if there are no problems, they can just be making nice for the customers. But if you have places, if you get a lot of negative feedback and social, um, if you might say, disfavor on certain changes, Companies won't do them. It's gonna if they're going all the business saying we're going to boycott this, we're going to go away, and people don't go there, then they'll go back to doing something else. So there, there's it, businesses have to kind of deal with what is the social response, what is the feedback. You know, uh, a lot of this is tr a little bit of it's trial and error. I mean, there's, they're obviously looking at costs, but they also have to get if you're dealing with humans and they're in a population, the customers, you have to say what is their response and what's best for our business. And you know, sometimes businesses will try something, and they may reverse the course because they say, "Hey, we're it's not working out for X reason or Y reason or whatever." But okay, okay. our next one. Okay, yeah, I'll let you make the choices. Yes. Um, I didn't understand about the brain um, extracting the brain information. Emulation. Emulation, because I would assume that this is a very powerful and it would be done on a dead brain instead of a live brain? No, so it has to be done on a live brain? Yeah, this is basically, just like now you have MRI for imaging disorder, this is a much more intense level of capability, but again, it's a scanning, which it might be a slow scan, but where you can, down to the very, like down to the cell level, you know, of uh, each brain, and, and so you can basically create a digital copy of a brain but again, again, how much of that detail, detail is needed for actually a functioning brain that kind of carries out the functions that we're interested in versus other... So what's the real difference between a live brain and one that is freshly dead at that cell level? They're all still there, they're all freshly dead. I'm not sure if a brain, that, if they were able to scan a brain that was a person that just died of minute or two ago, whether that would make a difference. I'm not a scientist that can answer that. Certainly, once you've gone a little bit of time, the brain starts dying. Cells here or there, and it, it adds up to significant differences. But, um, you know, if it was like almost immediately after death, I don't know if that would make a big difference. Uh, but, you know, again, I'm not a scientist, so I can't Sorry, huh? give that better answer. So, uh, Michael Casimir. Oh, yeah. um, I wonder if you can comment on the thing that I've heard. One is that the airline companies are thinking, uh, well, they've computerized cockpits so much, it's been created by pilots, that it's taken away their instincts. Could we have pilotless uh, commercial aircraft? Number two, could we uh, eliminate surgeons? And are they having robot, computerized robots do the surgery? The other thing that I have heard of, but not as much, um, and this is when you mentioned that they take the smartest person in a field and try to computerize them or robotize them, are, I suppose, people who work in dams and they watch to see the water coming into the dam, do they have to determine if uh, the dam is cracking or if it, in fact, is natural water coming down, they'd like to eliminate that job of monitoring. Uh, any comments on any of those three? Well, the, the, the third point, the, the monitoring, as I mentioned earlier, computers are very good at monitoring conditions. So yes, it, it makes a lot of sense to anything where it has to be monitored. You can do it without having, you know, to employ somebody to look at it. Uh, those, those kind of jobs are going to be gone uh, pretty soon because, you know, uh, it's you just the humans are a lot more expensive. A lot of, once you can get the cost down with the computers, um, 
Now, as far as surgery, they are starting to actually, we're getting more and more robots for uh, surgery, not only for manipulation, um, but I, I think I read re recently, I think it was with either a knee or a hip, whatever else, they, they were now getting somewhere they can, certain basic uh, operations, they can do it basically all automated and the doctor doesn't have to, you know, like hand manipulate the equipment. So we can see more of that happening as time progresses where more of the further more, I guess they kind of kind of easily understood type of operations that are sort of routine uh, can be done by uh, computers. That will probably reduce some of those costs. Uh, I don't know if I missed uh, the third part of your question, but those are two that I'm remembering right away. I, have you seen the movie uh, Ex Machina? Not yet. It's out right now. Uh, and also, uh, have you looked at the, uh, there's talk, um, can you comment on the trend to get rid of as many excess humans as possible and, you know, computerize the functions on freight trains? We just had a, a great accident. They want to have only one engineer. Or one, and when there's one person running, like one person opening a McDonald's, if there's a grease fire or something, who's going to be there to help that person? Isn't isn't you know uh, a certain level of autom autom automation a prescription for big disasters every now and then? Yeah. It could be. Um, and that's one of the things that you know, time, experience, everything will will teach whether. You know, at certain levels, you have to have greater levels of human involvement, or whether, like having one person in charge of a train, whether they can manage that, or whether that's too risky, you know, is the equipment that's at risk such that it's, it's too risky to go with one person. You know, the, it's going to vary from industry to industry, and you're going to have to, you know, there's probably going to be some experimentation and testing, so I, I can't give you any hard and fast rules, but you know there's going to be a reduction in, you know, the staffing in transportation greatly, um, but exactly how far they can go and how much they feel they need to, in a sense, adequately secure their capital and be safe. And I that just wonder their, if uh, their, my, my, my question was basically in, in your research, uh, your uh, presentation. Is, are there studies being done toward uh, how much human interaction can you cut out before you, uh, the disasters start to weigh, outweigh the cost of the labor that you're saving? You save a bunch of labor by laying 10 people's off, but every now and then you have a disaster. Yeah, and that, that is, this, they're looking in Fry Asthma, they're looking at, you know, which tasks can be, are likely to be computerized and capable of, you know. Then you got to look at, you know, again, through volume of, of the production of the robots, etc., and you know how you know those cost factors because you've got to have a certain cost down of the, the robots or other equivalents to make it feasible. But then, yeah, you've got to factor in all these factors. Does does use of the robots versus the humans bring about a track record of greater you know accidents and more? Um, uh, loss from uh, capital equipment and whatever. So th I don't think there's any hard and fast rule. I mean, there people, it's a, they're going to have to find out to experience what's doable and, you know, and, and they'll go out and make their decisions constantly. Okay, well, the reels. Yeah, I was thinking of the movie Ex Machina also, and many other movies where thoughtful people who have made these movies are envisioning um, repercussions from the emulations. So I, I guess my, my question is, um, um, you know, what what are your fears for like utter disaster or catastrophe possibilities? Uh, I don't know. Well, there are some people who are very smart in technology technology field, including Bill Gates. Uh, Elon Musk and some of these other people who are concerned that at some point uh, you will have robots and other artificial intelligence that will be gain uh, cognitive capabilities where they will in a sense supersede humans as far as capabilities and in a sense could take their own independence and, and, and things might roll out of control. 
So I have a little concern about that. Obviously, I have a concern about what's the impact on people, what's the impact on jobs and our, our social structure and everything. Uh, things might be structured well, but there's awful high risk that things won't be structured well and a lot of people are going to suffer. So I, I personally have to worry about first, you know, the impact on humans, you know, in this century and following of, from a conversion to a robot economy. That's primary concern. And then I have a secondary concern that, you know, maybe things will get out of control as far as having artificial intelligence that is in fact becomes more, uh, you know, cognitively capable people in, in the sense uh, direct their own future and become independent. So I have some concerns, but, and some other smart people have those concerns too. Um, you know, I don't have a matching answer on that. I just, those are my two concerns, I guess. Dan Weinberg? Um, all right. I, what is your interest in this in this subject? Are you uh, a robot manufacturer? No, I, I'm not. No, I'm. I had a 35-year career with the Social Security Administration, and uh, I'm retired. And I'm just, um, you know, I just I'm, I have a general interest in social economic conditions and so forth. And I'm. It's a. I, I'm just interested by you know this technological change and its impact on our society and workforce. And what are the implications? So it's a, just a general interest. I'm, I'm not an expert. You know, I just read some things and I put it together and I try to share it uh, in a way that I think is helps people understand some of these issues better. Um, but that's you know uh, I'm, I'm not a you know a robot scientist or anything else like that. Okay. Early beta. Yeah, Alan, uh, my niece worked in the McDonald's and she got in trouble because she served the customer a, a bun with no patty in it. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't We're all human, remember? Except, unless you aren't. <laughs> and I read about a restaurant run by robots, so wouldn't it eliminate operator error? Have you said anything about that? Well, again, there's probably no system that is uh, error-proof, but you go, you get into a whole bunch of issues. You get into what what is the rate of error, you know, and maybe the computers or uh, robots would be much less error-prone, you might say, but that doesn't mean they're totally error-free. They might have some glitches that might cause errors from time to time, you know. Um, that's part of software issues or, you know, lead maintenance or whatever. Um, so, anyway, so, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, there's different rates, but you also you consider cost, you consider everything, there, there's multiple factors to go into this, decisions of replacing humans with uh, computer capital and robots or whatever you want to call it. So. My own question is, wouldn't a robotic operated system be safer? It, it, again, it um, accidents and death. Yeah. Like a transit system. Yeah. There are probably a lot of situations where the robots might very well be safer, but it doesn't mean they're perfect. And you're going to have to have, you know, companies and society, to the extent you have any regulations in law, are going to have to put parameters in. They may want to say that there are certain areas where we do not want to have, we don't want to risk having robots be doing this, even though they might be, some experts might say, oh, they're quite capable. If society doesn't permit it, it probably won't happen. A lot of these things are going to take laws and regulations, and so uh, to allow certain things to happen. You know, just like the transportation changes, having, you know, trucks, cars, trains, whatever, airplanes, uh, controlled by, you know, by computers and not by people. You're going to probably have law, changes in laws, regulations, all kind of things like that. So there's there's a lot of social. Howard, yeah. The internet was developed because you had uh, the government uh, backing it, and uh, the question is, the looking forward to the things you're uh, enumerating. Do you think uh, the development will be largely with the government or the universities or private enterprise? Where, where do you think it's going to, uh, in order to get what you are looking forward to, what is necessary, uh, at what level? Uh, all of those will have 
an impact. Uh, universities will play a lot into, you know, uh, contribute to research and development uh, aspects. Some of it, they'll be leaders before they get, things get commercialized. But probably the two largest factors are going to be private industry on the one hand, and then government, because there's, as I said, <coughs> there's going to be a lot of areas where things are not going to be simply, businesses are not simply going to be able to go out and do them because current law requires humans to be involved in certain things. And you would have to change the laws or whatever to make that possible. And, you know, so you will get into the political arena as to whether to make those changes. So there's going to be government areas where government decisions are needed, and it's a kind of a social, you know, people making their feedback to their legislators as to what's, you know, whether that's okay or not. But there's other areas where there aren't those legal parameters and where private companies will be able to implement things by themselves. Second question. I have a second question. Where would you invest now to take advantage of what you foresee in the future? In other words, uh, assuming that you have other people that are uh, going to develop on the same lines, where would you invest? Well, something like General Electric or IBM or small companies? And maybe you can uh, enumerate some of the uh, good opportunities you're looking forward to. Okay, uh, there are a lot of companies, some large, some small, that are involved with robotics of all types. Um, if you're looking for like an ETF, uh, there's one called Robo, R-O-B-O, -O, which is a kind of an index of all the robotic firms out there. So maybe that's a, a good general investment tool. Uh, I've kind of looked at that for a while. It's, it's not been moving a lot recently, So, but I think as time passes, that might be a good general investment tool for a lot of and investors, just as some of the biotech ETFs like IBB and so forth have been uh, in biotechnology. And, but, so. All right, Don Ritchie. Okay, um, you know, back in the 1960s, there were a lot of predictors who um, in the vending machines where they made store clerks and um, restaurant servers obsolete they, because people would people would walk into the to the store or, or restaurant and they and, and, and they put their coins in the vending machine open the open the little door and take out the food they wanted to eat now how come uh, they, they predicted that, that, that you wouldn't have any more store clerks or waitresses or anything by about the year 2000. So well, we're 15 years behind on that. What happened? <laughs> Probably customer acceptance has a, a significant factor there. Uh, but also, you know, you're, you're getting into issues of, you know, um, if you're going to say equivalent service uh, to a human or something that's what we're expecting um, might be more quite more possible in the future versus then. So, but, but what happened in the past, I would say it all relies to what people were looking for in the way of a restaurant experience, and that was probably not what people were looking for. And so that, even though it might have been technologically feasible to have a fair amount of food available, it wasn't what a lot of people wanted, and so it didn't have you might say popular acceptance, and that was not, why it didn't work. Not just restaurants, yeah, but okay, so and would you say, but there, they didn't just have, in the 60s, they didn't have to have self-serve restaurants like that, like, they even had, you know, like in Japan and Europe and here, and I think somewhat in the U.S., they had even, like, self-serve stores, you walk in, and it's nothing but vending machines. Yeah. Oh, that one, no, no, but they, I've seen photos of these, they, they actually existed. Before I was born. Oh, I mean, you, so would you say that this because there just wasn't the customer demand, people just weren't interested in patronizing these places? Yeah, I'm not as familiar with, uh, with that whole uh, range of uh, that kind of store. <coughs> but so I, without knowing the details, I, I can't really comment. But I would say the vending machines are probably the uh, you know the customer acceptance. But the other, yeah, I don't really know enough details to really be a good judge on that. West Wagar. Oh, yes, West. So I guess uh, there'll be uh, no need for people to think anymore. Computers will think for us. Uh, I think people are going to still want to uh, 
to think. Now, the question is whether you would be needing to think as much to carry out a job. Obviously, if you're not working, you may not, your thoughts may be on other things. But I think people are still going to be thinking, and they're going to be using their brains, but it may be more for, uh, you might say, intellectual uh, enjoyment and you know, social interaction and other things like that, rather than to execute a job. Uh, you know, if you're not, obviously, if you still have the capability and can work, uh, you're still going to use your brain for that. But the, the more, there'll be a larger percentage of the population that will be using the brain for other than earning a living. David Singer? Um, in, you know, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in England, the workers broke, broke into the factories yeah. and smashed the machine. Is that a possibility today? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, the Luddites, uh, yeah, they, they, through, through history there's often been reactions against technological changes, and yeah, you can have a mass uprising. I mean, particularly if a large, if you have a large percentage of the population that's becoming unemployed, and you don't have a satisfactory social life, uh, that is very likely uh, that you're going to have, if you want to call it riots, rebellions, uh, social upheaval. So there's going to be a lot of pressure for, for um, through the political system to have an adequate safety net because otherwise you are likely to have, you know, uh, a, a kind of violent type of response to the, these developments if, if people are really being hurt uh, as a result. May, may I have something else? Bob Litt, I have uh, two questions. First one is, uh, what, is what is the likelihood a lot of these computer programs might be hacked because there's a lot of hackers out there? Yeah, uh, there, there. As we get more automated, and everything, all, all of these systems are at risk, and uh, uh, certainly a, a, a large number of them will be hacked for one reason or another. Now, most of the hacking tends to be for gain. Thus far, you know, either they're, they're you're, you know, there's people trying to get a hold of financial data or something to rip people off financially. Um, how much hacking there will be just because they don't like the computers, they want to, you know, show that they're not good replacements for me as, you know, like I'm a former employee and now I want to hack in and, <laughs> and, and stop the computer that replaced me or that sort of thing. So how much is that kind of reaction uh, as compared to personal gain? Um, you know, you could say, oh, it's hacking by a business com competitor. And so you're hacking into your uh, opponents or your, co your competitor competitors and equipment and so forth. You know, it's again, it's a matter of what kind of security, just like now with hacking that's going on now, are, you know, you're going to have to have protections for that, for these uh, equipment. And uh, I mean, part of it, if it's talking about between business competitors, you know, if you're hacking me, then I'm going to try, get, try to get somebody to hack you and that, you know. So you, you might say you could have a friendly piece where you don't hack each other or you're constantly attacking each other, uh, but, or you have uh, issues of just people wanting to hack because they don't like the technology. So you can have hacking for all kind of personal reasons, personal gain, just, you know, um, kind of, you know, dislike uh, for the technology or, you know, business reasons, etc. But again, there's going to be a need for security for the software, etc., the algorithms, uh, just as there is now, and you know, people get try to work around that, and they'll develop new stuff. So uh, that's going to be an ongoing issue. Yeah. So there's going to be more jobs in the uh, things to, in uh, preventing hacking. <laughs> that's another occupation that's going to be up. All right. Uh, second question. We have was, had enough. Uh, we're now in the rebuttal period. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, Margaret. Uh, is the only one who has raised her hand who hasn't already had a question. Yeah, okay. Why do you make this sound so inevitable? There are so many negatives, and he talked about social input. Why shouldn't there be more of a discussion and more decision making and not automatically assume that all this stuff is going to happen and all these people are going to lose their jobs? I mean, nothing is forcing us to do this. So I, I don't like this approach that this is inevitable and what's your life. Well, I think the part that is kind of inevitable is the advancement of techn computer technology and capabilities. Now, how much gets implemented 
again, a lot depends on social forces. In other words, what is social acceptance? What is governmental restrictions and uh, permissions? They're, they're, there's a lot of decision making that we as a society make that is going to determine the limits uh, of this. Uh, but I think the capabilities are going to are going to advance. But how much it will affect jobs, how much it will, you know, widespread certain things will happen, is is uh, you know impacted a lot by social reaction and social you know. Uh, yeah, a lot of it is not inevitable if there is social uh, restrictions on it. You know, we, we at least in the United States and uh, a lot of Western countries, you live in countries where there is some <coughs> citizen input on decisions, and you know, you can get you know, some people will say no, businesses controls everything, and you know, etc. But you're gonna. If you have citizen input, and, and I think the greater the social disruption, the more the citizen input will be, in a sense, spurred to coalesce on actions. You know, things can, can be controlled. It, it is a political, economic, social um, issue that's going to be very big in this century. And we as a society and the other Western societies are going to have to respond, make a intellectual social political decisions on, on these issues. Uh, but as far as the capabilities, I think that part is, you know, pretty certain that they're going to advance, but, you know, how, how much is implemented will a lot depend on us. Let's go to, Let's go to rebuttals. Oh, yeah, it's really early. Time for our rebuttal period. Let's thank our speaker. I'm going to have rebuttals. Oh, let me add one thing before we get into this. Um, any of you who wants like a you know a written copy of my presentation, basically, um, yeah, I have it electronically available. So either if you give me an email or I can send it to somebody else who would distribute it, that's that's fine. I can do that. So you know you don't have to take notes. I give you one handout, but the rest you know it's I have it written it's on a, a file and I can just email it out to people. But I don't know who to send it to, so you know. Um, Yes. Just let you know. You have to be on the line. I'm trying to listen. A piece that I'll recognize you to speak. Just raise your hand. Hey, would you guys keep it down? When uh, we're, the previous speaker is winding up or being told, Tim Bolger will tell us when the time is going to last. Or maybe a little bit. All right, our time's going to be five minutes, but I'm going first. <laughs> there is one thing that everybody is forgetting here tonight that has to be reiterated well, and that is I am a consumer. I am the one who buys your products. I am the one who makes the decision to invest in your business. I am the one who puts your profits from me because I have the one commodity you need and that is money to put you in business. That is, your money is comes from me and if you don't do what I want you to do, you're not going to get my money and you're going to be bankrupt. If you're too automated for me to get a hold of a human when I have a problem, I'm not going to patronize you. If I, as a consumer, go to a fast food restaurant and want a special request, and it's all automated and they can't understand me, I'll just drive off and put you out of business. I am the boss of your workers. I am the boss of your investment portfolios. I am the boss 
of who you are and who you govern. Amen. The essence of capitalism is pleasing the customer and making sure that they do a good business. If this pleases customers and this works, we'll see it. If it doesn't, then it'll be out the window and it'll be all done by our choice. Thank you. All right, boss. <laughs> Next. Good evening. You know, uh, Ann Rand pointed out in one of her books that adversity has some positive aspects. Uh, that uh, it has a way of bringing back a sense of reality. When times are too good for too long, people tend to get out of touch with reality. Uh, I witnessed this myself when I lived in Pittsburgh in the late 70s when things were going pretty good. And uh, I saw people who worked at the steel mills who couldn't read and they'd say, I wouldn't work for less than $20 an hour. But when we got into 1980 and 81 and so forth, and things got pretty hairy, uh, these same people were going out and working for 6 or $7 an hour, going out doing house painting and glad to be able to do it. So uh, economic adversity has a way of bringing us back to a sense of reality and a sense of basics. Uh, when, uh, when we have all this futuristic ideas of robotics, and I, I'm sure that robotics are good to a certain extent, and uh, I mean today they even have robots that will perform surgery uh, on people. I forget the name of it, but uh, it's, uh, it's a great uh, thing. People say it works, but these things are not uh, necessarily, you know, they're very expensive and like that, but times will, times are always changing. And uh, if we got into a, a, a bad, and if the bottom fell out, I mean, in 1929, uh, people were, uh, virtually everyone expected to become rich. Most of the people were playing the stock market and making money. Uh, there's a story that Joe Kennedy had his shoes shined out in front of the New York Stock Exchange by some little colored boy, and when he paid him, he gave him a tip. And uh, he said to the little boy, put your, save your money, put your money in the bank. And the little boy said, I'm going to invest it in the stock market. Oh. And Joe Kennedy thought to himself, if it's gone all the way down to where the local shoeshine boy is investing in the stock market, then who's left to invest anymore? And at that, he realized it was time to pull out. And he pulled all his investments out, and that was just a few days before the great crash of 29. Now, when the crash of 29 came, guys that were very arrogant, that uh, wouldn't work for less than a certain amount, and guys that had nice cars and were doing really great, they were walking the streets without a nickel in their pockets. Men that had been bank presidents were selling apples on the street. So, it, 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 no matter how good you're doing, economics can be such that things change that uh, you find yourself knee deep in shit. So, so uh, robotics is just one aspect of the world we live in, the culture we live in, and so forth. But, uh, and another thing, when they say, you know, things are so good anymore now that we 
really don't need to have any uh, recessions or depressions anymore. We've gotten beyond that. That is just about the time when there's going to be a recession or a depression. And uh, the only difference that we have is that in 29, when the market crashed, they didn't have a lot of things that came about later. They, they didn't have microwave ovens. They didn't have uh, cell phones. Uh, they didn't have uh, uh, many, many, many of the things that they later developed. So that means a greater economic uh, base would indicate would indicate that we uh, it might take longer for a crash to come. But they nevertheless they do come. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> Okay, okay, like what David was saying, uh, the, the fetties were a time when the stock market was going up and down, similar to now. Now it's at 18,000, the Dow Jones. That's the highest it's ever been. And, and that was similar to the 30s, or 29s, when it was very high, and uh, it crashed. So I think uh, the speaker before me was right, and uh, and the market could crash at any time. Uh, this is this is my piece of paper that's worth a lot of money, mm -hmm. and robots can't get one because this is the uh, World Clown Association membership card. And it's mine. My card. My name on it. Weinberg. Yeah. All right. Um, as far as robots go, uh, there was a movie in the 60s by uh, Stanley Cooper called 2001, A Space Odyssey. And um, there was a, a computer, Hale, that took over the ship. Now, what happens if a computer takes over? Are they benevolent? Are they going to be uh, liberals or conservatives? Are they going to be capitalists? Uh, you know, that's the question I have. When the, when the computers all get together in their meetings and they devise a strategy, what's going to happen? Um, I had something else to say. Um, the computers, yeah, hail, hail. Well, it's very Hell 9000, right? Computers and he took over the spaceship. Computers never forget. That's right. They never forget. Okay. Thank you. More tricks. All right. All right. Well. To, yeah, well, to air is human. To really foul things up requires a computer. Uh, you know. Um, so that's a that's a computer programmer saying. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of predictions about the future over the years, um, and most of the time the predictors sound very certain. They, they um, uh, you know, they, they describe things as pretty much inevitable, and and once in a while they're right. So they can remember the times that, that they got it right and forget about all the times they got it wrong and point to their proven track record of success. And, uh, but the truth is that it's guesswork. Because nobody can know what will happen in the future. There's, there's no way to know that. You can, you can say, oh, well, based on the way things have been going so far, this is what's going to happen. But you can't really know. And as Tim pointed out, you know, predictions about technology frequently don't take into account the factor of customer acceptance. I mean, you can, you can come out with all kinds of gee whiz technology and say, oh, by the year 2000, everybody will be buying, buying their food from vending machines. There won't be any more, there won't be any more old fashioned supermarkets. Or people will just walk into, a, into what used to be a fast food place and, and, and put their coins in and take the money out of a vending machine, take the food out of a vending machine. 
Well, those businesses didn't didn't work out as as um, as our speaker pointed out because uh, because of the lack of customer acceptance of them. Um, and so you can't really know what's going to happen in the future. It's, again, people people may or may not accept the new technology. They may refuse to buy it. They may go and and uh, and so it doesn't work out. Um, you can't so you can't really predict the future. I've predicted the future. Actually, sort of, in, uh, in my last presentation, I predicted that George I. Bush would probably end up getting the Republican nomination for president, although every new candidate that enters the race reduces the chances of any one candidate being the nominee, st uh, statistically. Um, now, but I, I stated that as a possibility, not as a certainty. And I don't, I don't think that anything is inevitable. I don't even think that one of the phenomena that you've seen all through history is the, the phenomenon that when you have mass unemployment, uh, you tend to wind up getting mass rebellion in society. Uh, but I don't think that's inevitable either. I actually think that the phenomenon of, of uh, mass rebellion can be, you can, you can have mass poverty and mass unemployment without the phenomenon of mass rebellion. And I think that, that, that we may have figured out how to do that here in the United States. I, I don't know, and, and the way, because for, for there to be a rebellion, people have to be organized. So the solution is obviously to promote a, 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 an ideology of individualism, where it's every man for himself, or every woman for herself, and where, where nobody works together, everybody regards every other human being on the face of the earth as a competitor. And, and then, no one will get together. So you'll have an individual hacker, an individual whistleblower, an individual who goes down to the workplace and shoots the place up, but you won't have organized rebellion. I could see that. I could see us having something like that in the future, no matter how bad things get for people. Um, and so, so what's going to happen in the future? I don't know. But all I would say is, is I just I've just been informed that I have one minute left. So all I would say is, don't listen to people who predict the future, and especially me. All right. <laughs> Five minutes. Look, I want to thank our speaker for an interesting talk. And I like the fact that you backed up your, your assertions with numbers. I'm a numbers kind of guy. Not everybody here is, but I am, so I, I like that. Uh, I, I do want to say that these, this technological advance, which has been uh, getting rid of jobs or reducing the number of people needed to do certain things, has actually been going on for decades and probably for centuries. Uh, with various advances going way back to uh, the Egyptians and even before that, even back to the cavemen. Uh, and generally, the results of these kind of advances benefit humanity as a whole. Uh, not in every case, but generally they do. The problem is that the benefit is not always uh, shared in any kind of an equitable way. Uh, in fact, one of our problems, in my opinion, in this country today is the massive inequity we have in, in uh, wealth and incomes. And that has gotten much, much worse uh, recently. Uh, and I think the problem is, uh, if we look at a numeric example, let's say uh, 25 years ago we could produce a certain standard of living with everybody working 40 hours a week. But because of technological advantages, uh, and better methods and, and so on and so forth, uh, we can now produce that same standard of living with 30 hours of work per week. This should benefit everybody. Everybody should either be able to work only 30 hours for the same standard of living or have a much higher standard of living if we work more hours. The problem is uh, the work uh, is not uh, allocated equitably. Uh, what we need to do, in my opinion, is think in terms of work not jobs. Jobs are a specific amount of work, usually around 40 hours a week. Uh, and there are so many jobs at 40 hours a week. But in fact, if we can get most of the most done, what we need to get done with only 30 hours, then what happens is the people who are working are doing very, very well, and uh, a certain number of people are being left out entirely. And I think that is a lot of what has, has happened to our society. So we need to think in terms of work not jobs, and we need to allocate the work in order to allocate the benefits. And this becomes a very tricky problem, 
administratively and politically. Uh, and so I don't have all the answers on how, on how to do it, uh, but I might suggest, for example, in other countries, uh, companies hire young people and give them on-the-job training. We don't do that as much here. Uh, I do not believe that uh, this rage for training is, is entirely the answer because educating and training people for jobs that aren't going to exist does little or no good uh, on, on the one hand. And some people have different aptitudes. Some people aren't good at certain things, but they're good at others. Now, unfortunately, the skills and talents that we need may favor one of those uh, talent groups versus another. And how we, how we deal with that is also a big, big social uh, and economic and political problem. Um, I do want to uh, address the issue of the, the uh, emulated brain, or call it an avatar if we want, that uh, in addition to being able to do the man's job also loves his wife. Uh, that is not necessarily a problem because we can always emulate the brain of the wife and create a female avatar so then things would equal out. In fact, we could create many avatars for this one person and if they were all living together, it could get very, very interesting. Look at me. Anyway, <laughs> so anyway, uh, and before I leave, one little uh, uh, is an anagram. Is that what a word? Is that what a letter problem is? An anagram? Do you all know the anagram about Hal? Uh -huh. oh, okay. Take and add one to each letter. H becomes A becomes L becomes. So there you go. <laughs> okay. By the way, last four blocks are winning three to nothing. All right, Ernie. All right, all right, all right. Socialism is the answer, Ernie. Hey, Tim, is it five minutes, Tim? It's five, it's five minutes, yes. That's the answer. Go ahead when you're ready. Okay. Go. Uh, I'd like to thank our speaker tonight for giving a really coherent presentation of things to think about. And uh, I agree with, is it Margaret? Margaret over there? Yes, yes, yes. That asked the question, uh, why do we accept the inevitability of these things? Why not? I think there's uh, some central questions that we should all be asking. Number one is what kind of a society do we want? Do we want one dominated by robots and non-human intelligence? Or do we want to live with more uh, human interaction, uh, much like the Amish people have. Um, question number two, do we have a responsibility, or do we not, to leave the planet in a livable condition for our children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren? Uh, this book I mentioned earlier, Unprecedented, is talking about the global consensus of scientists that are saying that if we don't get a uh, massive mobilization started like what was done in World War II where they manufactured you know tens of thousands of planes, tanks, everything else in a short amount of time like when they put the man on the moon in a short crash program. If we don't do that then everything that's talked about here tonight is going to be under 20 meters at 60 feet of water as the sea levels rise along the coast in the next 30, 40, 50 years. They're talking about a 20 meter sea level rise in the lifetime of the kids that are four or five years old right now. The science gets more and more and more solid and overwhelmingly non-debatable every year. <clears throat> the solutions are all around us. The new pope, in other words, I don't know if any of you have been following uh, the new pope, but uh, he's out there saying that we, we can't worship money anymore, you know, and rich people are saying, what does this world come to when we can't worship money? What does this world come to when the Pope of all means to all people is talking about trying to live according to the principles that Jesus taught? What does this world come to? Can we preach the Pope? Uh, we've, had, we've had 40 years, 40 solid years of anti-Christ Christian belief in this country, people calling themselves Christians, and everything they've been doing has been 100% anti-Christ, right on down the line, go for maximum profits, uh, mega churches taking in money and supporting the oil companies, 
Uh, the middle class has been solidly under attack for 40 years. Uh, the evidence is all around us. It helps to have a sense of humor. I, uh, one of my favorite, one of my favorite movies is Doctor Strangelove, because there's a spot in that movie where uh, George C. Scott, a uh, general, is talking to the president. The president says, I, "I was the only one. I was under the authority. I'm the only one that has the ability to launch our bombers and start World War III." And George says, "Well, yeah, you're the only one that has the authority. It appears that this general has overstepped his authority somewhat, but..." I don't see any reason to condemn the whole program for one small slip-up. <laughs> They're 25 minutes away from World War III. And then, of course, the Russian ambassador is there talking about the doomsday machine they built. If anybody sets off one bomb anywhere in the doomsday machine at both poles will blanket the whole planet with radioactive cobalt and eliminate human civilization. And Dr. Strangelov says to him, says, well, the whole point of a doomsday machine is you have to tell somebody. You can't keep it to yourself. Yeah. Anybody that's ever worked with computers knows that there's there's one little thing that we didn't, you don't hear talked about. They're talking about the benefits of computers. Well, computers work great until the central processor goes into a, what we call a, 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 a it's a, an area that can be best described as microchip grab ass, and. The microchip grab ass is a term we use when an electronic thermostat starts to malfunction and the house is heating up. If nobody's home, uh, you can burn the house down if the furnace is running wide open. Um, these kinds of things, as you go up in complexity, if you have robots uh, governed by computers, like I mentioned with, uh, you know, the, it's nice to have a robotic engineer watching all the things on the, on the train. You wouldn't even have a live human in the cab. It would be all automated until you have a malfunction and uh, an 18-car 18, 18 train goes off the track. So, um, you know, the, I would, before I would look toward a, a computer automated society, I would take a personal visit to go to one of the Amish communities and see, uh, you know, look at the wisdom those people have with human interaction uh, versus, uh, you know, looking at a pile of microchips and name it George as your best friend. Thanks. Next. I got to agree with Andy. I think people are getting sick of computers. And, uh, robots and all this electronic crap. All you have to do is call up a, a help desk one time and you have to push, listen to about 10 different menus <coughs> a couple times when, and sub-menus, and you'll know what I'm saying. Anyway, I've been, um, I have been pretty much selling robots and electronics all my life. I worked for Bridge a defense contractor, Bridgeport Textron, for many years in the middle working business. That was all computer, uh, computer controlled equipment. And then I spent a bit of time with Diebold, and I don't know if you ever heard of Diebold, but them and NCR, the big uh, ATM manufacturers here, and, and voting machines, right? <laughs> I wasn't there very long, they were a little too conservative for me. Wouldn't put, put it past them that they. Uh, it's a funky voting machine. So. Um, and now I'm with Honeywell and uh, ADT Tyco, and that's electronic assisted equipment all over the place. I think what happens, I don't think this uh, country or, or society is going to be inundated with robots and electronics. Uh, what happens is these big companies, Textrons and Diebolds and Honeywells and all that, they just, they're, they're looking for the next ATM robot where so they're throwing a lot of crap out there, and I've had to sell this crap, and eventually something sticks, and it's, it's going to make a lot of money. But a lot of this stuff comes and goes. It seems, you know, it's, you know, some of it's good, some of it's bad. Like, it, you know, these days an ATM is super easy to use. I've sold as many. But <laughs> get me in a CTA station, and what's the hell is a CTA machine called? Ventro. I hate that damn thing. I, <laughs> I tell the CTA all the time this was the worst design machine ever. But you know that. 
It's a pain in the ass. It's just a pain. No, it ain't that easy. The last machine was much easier. I just used one. It's not as easy as the other, the little swipe card thing. I want something easy. Well, you put in cash, probably. I put in my damn debit card. It isn't as easy as an ATM. And I forget how to use the damn thing every $20 that I put in. Anyway, so, uh, but then it'll give the chance for the cubic company to come back to the CTA and sell, sell another half billion dollars in machi machines and updates. Or open a contract out for bidding. <laughs> nah. Wow. Nah. No, no bid. This is America. <laughs> no bid. <laughs> Anyways, so go Hawks and uh, down with Wall Street, as always. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's give a hand again to our speaker. I really, I thought that was a very good, very good presentation here. Uh, by, uh, uh, we we have a uh, be sure to get the schedule on the back. It's beautiful. We have a Yahoo group and a, a meetup group. And about a month ago, I sent out that article about a, a robot restaurant. In which it was operated entirely by robots. Um, so maybe I'll send that out again, you know. Um, Don and some of you other guys, I'm surprised. You don't know this gentleman's talking about the Industrial Revolution. You're history type guys. This is merely an event in the Industrial Revolution that commenced in 1800. Um, it's not anything that began in 1960 or anything like that. It's been in progress. Um, it, robotics um, and machines uh, allow precision, uh, speed, and they relieve us of <laughs> things that are dirty and dangerous. Um, I happen to like to watch, about the only TV I watch is the thing on the Science Channel is called How It's Made. I'm sorry, sweetheart. And I watch that, and sometimes I even watch it. They had one that was went on all, all week. And everything in about 15 minute segments. The only thing they don't show in there are that these um, machines are don't operate with terrible consistency. Uh, and perhaps when they're doing the episode or filming it, but it's rare that you get these uh, things to operate with any degree of precision over time. And I think that's the problem with all of this technology that you were discussing. Um, the other thing is, when automation came in libraries, and I was director of circulation is, and this is where I challenge your basic premise, we were always told this will not re result in a reduction in your staff. You will employ as many clerks as you did before. You will have better records, they are retrievable, you can get more data about circulation in your library, but you are not going to be able to operate your library with less individuals employed there. And I think the same thing applies here. Now you also gave the example there about a car, and there was an experiment in which various universities uh, tried to have an automobile just go from point A to point B uh, without a predetermined course, and not one vehicle was able to complete it. This technology is uh, not quite there yet. Perhaps if you have vehicles on tracks, um, you do. Uh, another thing that's actually there's been automation, and I know from being a railroad guy, uh, you've been able to purchase a ticket by a, I, I guess you call it a robotic girl called Jane, and she's been around for about 10 years. If you ever go to Amtrak and try it, it's kind of fun. The airline industry tried to get her to give a date. They had a guy called Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, but basically, yeah, and, and Margaret Goldstein, 
you're not going to stop progress, and certainly not technological progress. That's not going to happen. I don't, I don't, and why are you afraid of it? I, it has to be stopped? What does it have to be stopped? Human progress is going to be stopped. And Tim, where are you going? My friend, if I can go to the robotic restaurant and get a hot dog for 10 cents, I think I'm going to, how many people are going to go to your place where you got some guy and a gal, some guy with an apron making hot dogs or something like this for a dollar? What you do, Charlie? Yeah, you you get a good robotic get restaurant, yeah. right? You get a good looking hey, waitress because yeah. sex yeah. sells. Yeah. Chuck's, Chuck's robotic hot dogs by, made by androids for dying. <laughs> <laughs> Bring your sack. <laughs> Put it there. The, we um, take all special orders and all requests, Charlie. The other thing is, and he hit on this a little bit, I'm going to give you folks a little help here. And I shouldn't tell you this. We were talking there. This transit systems have been operating without drivers for years. San Francisco had it when they put their thing in BART years ago. What, there's still somewhat of something of an amusement. No one got hurt. But the very first time they tried their system operating without drivers in each car, one of the trains came to a station and continued on through the station without stopping and flew out onto Market Street. <laughs> now I will tell you though that I have been lobbying against these crude oil tank car trains, but I haven't told anyone except you guys. But the accidents regarding crude oil tank car trains, one or two of them were operator errors. And yes. That's because you only have one operator, yeah. right? No, there's none. You don't need you don't need more. You don't need any. No. You really don't. The technology is, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 no. What's so hard? Wait, I'm gonna tell you what's so hard you go to a machine, like you say, venture, you put it on the machine and says Do you want to put money on your card? And I go, yes. And I give it ten bucks, and it's his thing. And your time's What's up, Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> your time is up, no, Charlie. No, no, robotic. I only go answer to the robot. Now, thank you, though. <laughs> All right. Hey. Uh, that was entertaining. One man on the whole. You don't need a guy. You don't need that They only got one inside. How many more left? So uh, I'm not I'm talking about the uh, Okay, Brown. I remember the first experience I had with automation. I was about four years old and my mother brought me to a Hornet Hardart uh, automat uh, in New York. Uh, you put a a nickel in the slot, and you got out your piece of pie or whatever it was, your sandwich. Uh, a Hornet hard art uh, hasn't been doing too well lately, uh, but they, for many years, they were they were uh, well invested and uh, profit making uh, uh, machine. Uh, company. Uh, when it comes to a modern automation, uh, go to your local hospital. Uh, all your 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 nurses and your doctors are uh, automated. Uh, they 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 punch the clock. Uh, they are time and motion studies uh, in themselves. Uh, people are evaluated on how fast and how many uh, patients uh, they handle uh, and what kind of services they do and uh, those services are, are measured uh, by uh, time. So because they have to be paid, they have to be paid, the, work, the labor market even though there is a reserve army of the unemployed, nevertheless demands a living wage. A living wage. What is a living wage? A living wage is, however, 
the uh, market defines it. Uh, yeah, and you've just got to be in an advantageous place in the market uh, to uh, make what you would consider a living wage. Uh, I no, the, the, the question of uh, how uh, Susan's uh, 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 time is measured, uh, uh, she, she is bustling. Uh, uh, and that is because, you know, people have to go home at night, the place has to close on, uh, people have, uh, there are schedules. And, and, oh, uh -huh. All I need is $11 and we're good. Yeah, eleven dollars. You. you get $12 actually because somebody came in and uh, we owe you a dollar ahead for, for everybody who comes in here. Uh, okay, so, yeah. yes, the market sponsors Profit making, profit making has to be, you, know, you have to be efficient. And efficiency, uh, as long as automation works for efficiency, uh, you will get more and more automation and cybernation. But I don't know about emulations of humanity. That's uh, another subject in itself. Okay. All right. Very good. Anybody? Oh, we all. Raconteur and uh, a, all right. a good speaker. Next. Next. Oh, I'll try to live up to that uh, introduction. Um, we often find ourselves terrified at the idea of computerization, uh, you know, of cybernation, the whole thing. The fact of the matter is, it, like money, is a tool. Money, as we all know, can be a wonderful thing, or it can be a nasty thing to have to deal with. Booze can be a wonderful thing, or it can be a terrible thing to deal with. Likewise, technology can be both a wonderful thing and a tyrant. I'd be interested in knowing uh, how many of us have thought that before we get to this brave new world that we're talking about here, we first have to decide what kind of a society do we want to be? Do we want to be a society where we allow all of our decisions to be made by some machines or by, by some great eminences uh, in lab coats uh, somewhere you know deep in the mountains? Or do we want to be a society which has to be more involved than ever? Especially terrifying is the idea that it may well be possible to duplicate uh, what is going on in the minds of an individual, put it on ice, and then ten years later, uh, your widow or widower uh, can converse with you. That sounds fine, but if we can pull that, we can also alter what's going on in the brain. And how far are we from having a tyrant or merely a technologically savvy ward healer uh, altering the brain in such a way that the votes miraculously turn out? for a given candidate, a new form of voter fraud, if you will. How far do we go with the judicial system? Where do we have a computer no, no, no. where we put in all of the information about the crime and we put in all of the extenuating circumstances and we crunch the numbers and then out pops the answer, guilty, a death by hanging tomorrow, 6 a.m. Uh, the fact of the matter is that unless we're careful, these things are going to run us instead of us running them. I'd like to see a society where we view 
money, technology, even booze, as tools, not masters. If we don't do that, if we don't start thinking very seriously about how we want to use this stuff, which is, for, and it's not just a continuation of the Industrial Revolution, as the previous speaker pointed out, it's the beginning of a whole new revolution where we do have an opportunity to become, at least in parts of the world, uh, a, much, a much more livable type of society. Or we can be, be the beginning of Brave New World. I think you've all read the book. Uh, I think you've all read 1984. We're at a crossroads. We can have those choices, but we have to make those choices now. And I think I am making the choice to get off before I get thrown off this <laughs> Just FYI, if you like the subject, um, Museum of Science and Industry has just opened up an exhibit, Robot and its Revolution. Robot Revolution, and it's full of these machines. It's interactive live demos. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, there is nothing. There is one area that we've all looked at but will never be approached by robots. And that is right now, Chicago is leading in the Stanley Cup and then and four to nothing against Los Angeles. And thank God that is one thing, Anaheim, and that is one thing that will never be computerized. Go Hawks! Yeah, for nothing now. Okay, uh, for my final words, most of the speakers, I have nothing to, you know, I agree with you. There's no, I'm not, you know, all fine comments. Uh, the only thing I want to comment to a couple of the pe people, uh, you know, it's about social acceptance, uh, market acceptance of certain technologies. And yes, certain things will not be accepted, and other things will be, but pattern has been where we have been having a lot of technological change involving automation, cost and jobs, and that's likely to continue to increase over the next 20 years. We've seen in the past where a lot of changes were out there, you know, like introduction of ATM machines, you could have said, oh, everybody's going to refuse to use them and they'll, they'll use, want to use the teller instead. Well, a lot of these changes, maybe some people will hold out and say, I don't want to deal with you know, a non-person, but other people will use the thing. So there's going to be a lot of situations where you'll have choice. And you know, you, there'll be a differential in cost. You can use the human, it'll cost more, but if you want to do that, that's fine. I use the example of, uh, you know, you might, if they have copies of, uh, you know, a very talented person or something, what do you use? You know, the human who might be less qualified and more expensive versus the emulation or something or robot that's better qualified. And uh, different people will make different choices. That Those are decisions which we as a society will make. Um, but I think history shows that at least a, a significant part of the population will, will opt to say, I'm going to use the option that's less expensive and more effective rather than the one that might be more, quote, human or humane. Uh, that's just history has shown that that is often the case, but not all people will react the same way. So that's my comment on that. Uh, uh, you know, not everything is going to, I'm not saying I'm going to, I'm picking future of perfection. I'm just saying where the trends are and what's likely to happen with technology. And, but you know, obviously when we actually get the technology and to try to implement it, you know, they have to evaluate a lot of things to determine whether it will actually stay. Uh, so, with that, I'm going to close.